It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians 4.20. Galatians 4.20. Here we begin the subject of an allegory from grace. Actually, the Apostle Paul is going to use an allegory. Allegory is spelled A-L-L-E-G-O-R-Y. The Apostle Paul is going to use an allegory from grace. And the allegory begins in Galatians 4.20 and 4.21. I keep on desiring to be present with you now and change my tone of voice because I continuously stand in doubt about you. Keep telling me, you who continually desire to be under the authority of the law, do you not hear and understand the law? So that's Galatians 4.20 and 4.21 and the beginning of an allegory. Now in Galatians 4.20 we have Paul's desire. This is Paul's desire in Galatians 4.20. In Galatians 4.21 we have the desire of the Galatians. So Galatians 4.20, Paul's desire. Galatians 4.21, the Galatians' desire. What is Paul's desire? I keep on desiring to be present with you. Now this was a desire from the emotional pattern from the Greek. From the Greek language it refers to an emotional desire. And this desire is not from rationalism. He desires to be with the Galatians from an emotional standpoint because they've been going against grace. The imperfect tense here is linear action, sorry. And it's actually re referring to an emotional desire and it is not God's will. It is not God's will at this point for Paul to be with the Galatians. If it were God's will for Paul to be, to the, to be with the Galatians, Paul would be with the Galatians. Therefore, he had to give them this information in a non-face-to-face manner. So the present tense meant to be with them in a dramatic way. It was Paul's desire to be with them in a dramatic way. It is a dramatic present tense. And he wanted to come to them dramatically and chew them out right off so that then they could change. But see, he's not able to be there, so he doesn't know if they're changing or not. So he's going to keep on pounding and pounding and pounding from Galatians. And why is he going to do that? Because God in eternity past knew that Galatians would be needed for us. So it was, Paul's, it was God's desire that Paul not go to the Galatians. And Paul did not go to the Galatians. He wrote to them. And the reason Paul wrote to the Galatians and was able to keep pounding them and pounding them and pounding them concerning the legalism that they were falling prey to is so that we could take a look at it now some 2,000 years later and that's God's grace and how gracious God is to give us Galatians today because in our country we surely need it. So Galatians 4.20, I keep on desiring to be present with you. Paul wanted to be face to face with them, but that was an emotional desire and it was not God's desire. It was God's desire that the Apostle Paul write to the Galatians so that it could be uh, left for history's sake and left for us. And so this is why we study Galatians because Paul could not be present with them. Because Paul could not be face to face with the Galatians, it has turned out to be a blessing for us. And because I could not be face to face in Baraka Church, it's, been, it's turned out to be a blessing for me as well. So I keep on desiring to be present with you now and change my tone of voice. Now changing his tone of voice means this. He wanted to change his tone of voice because right now he's having to chew him out, chew them out. 
and he wants to straighten them out and then once he sees face to face that they've been straightened out he can change his tone of voice but the fact is he's still in doubt about all of that he's in doubt about whether they've changed their mind or not and they haven't changed their mind as of yet and so because he's still in doubt he still has to pound the pulpit as it were he still has to chew them out from the means of his writings. So he, want, he, he, he wants to know if they're straightened out or not, but he can't know that while he's far away. So instead of softening his tone now, he continues chewing them out. And it's a good thing he did so because it's for our benefit that he chewed out legalism. Because if there's anything that is detrimental to Christianity, it's legalism. Lasciviousness is bad enough, but legalism is far worse because legalism is blinding. People get into legalism, they don't even know that they're wrong. They justify their legalism and they think they have every right to be in that legalism. So continuing now, so he wants to be with them now and change his tone of voice because I continuously stand in doubt of you. That's what it says at the last part of Galatians 4.20 because I continuously stand in doubt about you. The middle voice here means that doubting the Galatians personally benefits Paul. This means that he can clarify and straighten out the situation. The indicative mood here means that Paul isn't kidding with them. He's chewing them out and he's not chewing them out with any joke about it. He's not kidding. And what it means is he genuinely doubts them and he's very suspicious of them and he should be he should be very suspicious of the Galatians because they've been seduced by a bunch of legalists so he's very suspicious of them and he's not psychotic for being so he's right for being suspicious he needs to be suspicious of these Galatians and that's why God did not allow the Apostle Paul to be face to face with them at this point so he could write it down and make it permanent history so that he could make a record for history now the application from verse 20 means that sometimes our desire and God's will don't match up it was the apostle Paul's desire to be with the Galatians but his desire did not match up with God's will and our desire oftentimes is not the desire of God's will so as far as Paul was concerned Paul wanted to be with them. But Paul needed to write Galatians so that we could have it right here some 2,000 years later. And so even though Paul's desire was not going to be fulfilled, a greater thing was going to come out of that. And that greater thing coming out of this is the fact that right now we have available to us the epistle to the Galatians. Now in 421, Galatians 421, we have the Galatians' desire. What is the desire of the Galatians? So keep telling me, you who continually desire, again, this word desire is emotionally. Paul emotionally desired to be with the Galatians. And the Galatians emotionally desired to be under the Mosaic Law. And any time you want to go under the Mosaic Law, it's a result of the emotional revolt of the soul. That means you've already moved into reversionism. When you go under the law, you have rejected doctrine. You've neglected it. You've rejected it. Then you've gone under the emotional revolt of the soul. And as a result of the emotional revolt of the soul, it is the desire emotionally of the Galatians to be under the authority of the law. Then he goes on to say, Do you not hear and understand the law? So again, Galatians 4.21, corrected translation, Keep telling me, you who continuously desire emotionally to be under the authority of the law, do you not hear and understand the law? So what this means, it's one thing to hear something. Of course, they heard the law. It's one thing to hear something. It's another thing to understand it. And they didn't understand the law. They've, they've heard the law, but have you now heard the law? But do you understand that the law is contrary to grace, is what Paul is asking them. 
Do you realize that you're now getting into something that's going to destroy your unique spiritual life? No, they didn't understand that. They heard the law and they didn't understand the implications of the law. And once they got under the law, they were not going to fulfill their spiritual life. So here we have in Galatians 4.20 and Galatians 4.21 a contrast between Paul's desire and the Galatians' desire. Now verse 22 and verse 23 are an historical incident. Allegories oftentimes do not use historical incidents, but in this allegory everything is historical. This is not a parable, this is an allegory. So verses 23, 22 and 23 are an historical incident which means this is not pure allegory in that fictitious things in a pure allegory are set up. But these things actually happen. And in verse 20, 22 and 23, we will note that these things actually happen. Now, what is going on here is the Galatians have been seduced. They've been seduced by a bunch of legalists. And we will note later how we should separate fully from legalism, how we should separate from those who practice legalism, how we should separate from churches that practice legalism, how we should separate from people that practice legalism. We'll note that in Galatians, and Paul's going to make it very clear. And actually last night as I was studying these things, I about stood up and cheered because it's, the sum, it's some of the things I've been teaching you and right here we have biblical verification as if I didn't know there was biblical verification. But there's a lot more biblical verification than just this. But this should be enough to wake people up. Separate from legalism. Now there's a dissertation we must look at on salvation by grace or salvation by... actually a dissertation on salvation and spirituality by grace rather than works. Now, first of all, now I've given you seven things before. I'm going to give you a whole list of them. It's a list. You might think of it as review, but it's a list that we need to go over once again. And it's a list of things that legalistic churches have come up with in our country. And they came up with similar things in the country of Galatia. Actually, they were part of the Roman Empire. But first of all, it says... Uh, people will today will say you need to rent, repent and believe. Repent and believe, which means feel sorry for your sins. And even if you have been saved, you better feel sorry for your sins after your salvation. That's number one. Number two, con confession of sins before salvation. They will say in order to be saved, you must confess your sins even before salvation. Confession of sins is something that occurs after salvation. Number three, begging God to save you. That's something that's not part of faith alone in Christ alone and definitely part of legalism. Number four, inviting Christ into your heart. That's part of legalism. It's an addition. Just as the, during the time of the Galatians, the Judaizers were adding circumcision, people today add invite Christ into your heart or acknowledge Christ publicly either for spirituality or salvation. That's number five, not part of it. Number six, ritual works. Ritual works. Catholics oftentimes go in for these ritual works. And that is to go through certain rituals like baptism for salvation or for spirituality. We have then circumcision. And that was back in the olden days. I don't know of anyone today who says we must be circumcised to be saved except for the Jews of today. Then we have baptism. Number eight. Number nine, come forward and be saved. I'm going to go through these quickly because we've gone over many of these before. Number ten, raise your hand during prayer and be saved. Or raise your hands to be spiritual. That's not part of it. Walking down an aisle to be saved. Or walking down an aisle to be spiritual. Not part of it. All of us here today probably know all of this, but it's good to have reinforcement because if the Galatians can go astray, we can. And if the Apostle Paul himself, who later on went astray, we can too. So we need to have repetition. And we need to understand these things and to have these pounded into our brains so that we never ever hop away from grace, just as the Galatians did. So walking down the Nile, giving public testimony about your faith in Christ, there's nothing wrong about giving a public testimony, but that has nothing to do with spirituality or salvation. 
And many people attach spirituality to you giving a public testimony. Or you must join a church. Whether you join a church or not doesn't mean you're saved. Or you must tithe and give offerings. That doesn't mean salvation. Or you must keep the Mosaic Law. Or you must do penance. Or you must practice the Lordship of Christ. Or you must practice asceticism, which means you must give up something in order to be saved. Or you must maintain a healthy body. If that were the case, the Apostle Paul would have never been spiritual because the Apostle Paul rarely had a healthy body. The Apostle Paul had more health problems than any of us sitting here today. And part of that was to push him forward in the spiritual life. So keeping a healthy body has nothing to do with spirituality. Neither does salvation by morality. You can't be saved by morality, nor can you live the spiritual life by morality. Or salvation by a personality change, meaning now that you're saved, you're going to be sweet. Some of the worst people on the face of the earth in terms of personality are saved and they will rip you apart behind your back. Or salvation by ecstatics, that is, becoming emotional, running up and down aisles, speaking in tongues, throwing your hands up in the air, praising God in ways that are weird. Or salvation through feeling. you got to feel saved or you got to feel spiritual. None of that is part of it. Or salvation through weeping tears at the altar. Weeping tears in an altar doesn't get you close to salvation, not even close to salvation. Esau wept for salvation, yet it was not credited to his account for righteousness. Esau went to hell. So salvation through weeping tears or spirituality through weeping tears, all of which is incorrect. Or you must commit yourself for salvation. Incorrect. You cannot commit yourself for salvation or commit yourself in spirituality. Spirituality is the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And also we have lordship salvation. Make Christ Lord and you will be saved. Or you will not be spiritual unless you make Christ Lord. You can't make Christ Lord. Christ is already Lord. You can recognize Him as Lord if you grow in grace. But you can't make Him Lord. What kind of arrogance is that? A lot of it. And that's exactly the way the Galatians went. And the, and the Galatians had their own historical background in which they went against grace. And so therefore we have this allegory developed by the Apostle Paul. Now we must have an, an historical background of this allegory. And we must look at this uh, from the basis of Romans 4.16. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 4.16. Romans 4.16 gives us an historical background of this allegory. As part of this historical background of this allegory, Abraham had Ishmael. And why did Abraham have Ishmael? From human viewpoint. It was the human viewpoint of Abraham that ended up in Ishmael. Actually, it was the human viewpoint of both uh, his wife Sarai and Abraham. Abraham and Sarai got together and Sarai said, Hey, Abraham, we need to have a child. Well, let you go over here and have sex with Hagar, our slave, and you make us a child from that. And that will be the child of promise. But this was human viewpoint. So Abraham had Ishmael. And he looked to Ishmael as the fulfillment of all his problems. You see, Sarai had never had a child. And in those days, having a child was utmost importance. And she was uh, going on 90 years old at this point and had never had a child, maybe in her 80s at this point, and had never had a child. And so, so what she's been doing, she has been nagging Abraham to death. She's been saying, you know, we need a child. And then Abraham would say, but you know God's promised us a child. But then through her nagging, she finally broke Abraham down. And, Abraham, and finally she came up with a clever idea. Well, I want a child, and the way you're going to give me a child is through Hagar, our slave. And so Abraham agreed. and said, all right, I'll have sex with this Hagar. And you see what his lust is, sexual lust. It's normal for a man almost. It's part of his lust, lust of the old sin nature. So he just hopped right into bed with, for most men. And he just hopped right into bed and had sex with her. And out comes Ishmael. 
And Abraham at this point thinks that Ishmael is the fulfillment of all of his problems. But all of this is human viewpoint. And this is one of the times when Abraham did not believe the promises of the Lord. So Romans 4.16 Therefore, it is out of the source of faith that by grace to the end that the promise might be stabilized to all the seeds not only to those who are under the law, but also to those who have faith of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And Abraham being the father of us all means that Abraham followed the procedure. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. He became the pattern. And that's what it means. Abraham is the pattern. Romans 4.16 again. Therefore, it is out of the source of faith that by grace to the end that the promise might be stabilized to all the seeds. Why are we seeds of Abraham? By faith. Not only to those who are under the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham, meaning Gentile can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and Jew can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the father of us all meaning Abraham is the pattern. Now in Romans 4.17 as a background to this allegory. As it is written, I have made you father of many nations. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. Now out of this we know that Abraham has a wife. Her name's Sarah, which means princess at this point. Abraham is 99 years old. Sarah is 90 years old. And from the human viewpoint, there is no possible way that they can have children. No woman today, 90 years old, can have a child. But, and that's the human viewpoint at that time. It's a hopeless situation. However, in Genesis 17.5, it, it gives us some daylight to this situation. And this is the promise to them in Genesis 17.5. If you want to look, go ahead, but hold your place in Romans 4.17. And in Genesis 17.5, it says this. If you want to flip there, hold your place in Romans 4.17 because we've got to continue in Romans. And now we have Genesis 17.5. And we're going to get into something phenomenal here. I was about cheering all night last night. I was a happy fellow studying we're going to see why in a moment. It's going to get, uh, Paul's going to really start making some sense from this allegory. Genesis 17.5 No longer will your name be called Abram. Now what does Abram mean? Abram means father of high and windy places. Abram, father of high and windy places. No longer will your name be called Abram, father of high and windy places. High and windy places indicates what? Nothing. A lot of wind, a lot of, uh, you know, you're up on a mountain, a lot of wind. It indicates no children whatsoever. So Abraham's name, start, Abram's name starts out meaning father of high and windy places. But your name will be Abraham. Now what does Abraham mean? Abraham means father of many nations because I have made you a father of a multitude of nations. So his name went from Abraham, father of high and windy places, to the name of Abraham, meaning father of many nations, because God has made him the father of a multitude of nations. Now you've got to understand, back in the ancient world, if you're walking around as Abraham... And let's say you are at the age of 95. And you're walking around and somebody says, uh, Hello, how are you? And you say, My name's Abraham. Well, they'll know right off Abraham means you're the father of many nations. And they'll look around Abraham and they'll see no children. No children and barely any relatives whatsoever. So they'll start wondering to themselves, Why is your name Abraham? You don't even have any children. And Abraham believed the promise so much he would just say to them, God has promised that I will be the father of many nations. 
And you have to understand what faith that takes when you're 95 years old and childless. But he had the faith. Abraham staggered not at the promise of God in unbelief. So this is where we get the beginning of this promise. And then it goes on in Romans 4.17. You can flip back to Romans 4.17 now. We're through with Genesis 17.5. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our father in the presence of God whom he believed, the God who makes the dead alive. Now what's that mean to make the dead alive? Well, this has to do with the deadness of his reproductive genes. It, it, this is what Abraham had, re, had uh, dead reproductive genes. He was unable to procreate along with Sarah, unable to procreate. So what this means is this. Abraham's 99 years old and sexually dead. His wife is 90 years old and she can't procreate anymore, of course. So humanly, from the human viewpoint, it is absolutely impossible for them to have children from the human viewpoint. The dead, therefore, means the deadness of their reproductive organs. And that's all it means where it says, He is, he is our Father in the presence of God whom He believed, the God who makes the dead alive. That is, the God who makes the sexually dead alive. Continuing, And summons the things that do not yet exist as though they already do. So God gave them this promise. God gave them the promise, and when the promise given was given, it was given as if it had already happened. And that's why Sarai laughed. Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ came in the form of an angel and uh, came down to Abraham, and while uh, Sarai was over in the tent doing something else, uh, this angel said, you're going to have a child. Where here, here, here is this 90-year-old woman, and she hears that she's going to have a child, and she laughs. <laughs> yeah, right. And then the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ, heard her. Of course, he hears everything. And uh, he looked at Abraham and said, Why does your wife laugh? And he looks around and says, I don't even see her around here. What do you mean, why does she laugh? And he says, Why does your wife laugh? She was laughing at the Lord and the promise. And then you know what our Lord did as part of his sense of humor? He said, all right then, when you have this child, you will name him Yitzhak, which means laughter. Isaac. Isaac means laughter. So now they're going to have this child, and when it's born, Sarah is going to have to be begrudgingly call this child laughter. Why? Because she laughed at the promise. Don't laugh at the promises of God. They'll come true. And they did with Abraham and they will with you. So God gave them the promise. And when the promise was given, God gave this promise as if it had already come to pass. And that's why he called Abraham a father of many nations before Abraham was a father. Before, even, before he was even a father... God called him a father of many nations before he even had one son. So this is the humorous part of it and the fact that uh, Abraham now is the father of many nations is quite humorous because it all occurred after he was 99 years old. Now let's, let, let's look at Romans 4.18 as part of the background of this allegory. Romans 4.18 Against hope Against hope, that's Elpis, against confidence. And this is a phrase for human viewpoint. Against all human viewpoint. Against the fact that this is humanly impossible. It's humanly impossible for a 90-year-old woman to give birth. Humanly impossible. So against hope, against confidence, means against human viewpoint against the fact that it's humanly impossible for someone to give birth at 90. Abraham believed in hope. That means he had confidence. Abraham had confidence with the result that he became the father of many nations according to the pronouncement, so will your descendants be. So the promise came to fruition against human viewpoint. 
human viewpoint would have said not possible but it is possible from divine viewpoint now let's look at Romans 4.19 without becoming weak in faith he considered not his own body as dead that means sexually dead Abraham himself at the age of 99 had become sexually dead and not only was he sexually dead but Sarah was sexually dead they were both sexually dead now some men can live on into their hundreds and not be sexually dead i.e. Uh, Strom Thurmond but in this case Abraham he became old and became sexually dead along with his wife Sarah who had become sexually dead many 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 years before this time so without becoming weak in faith he considered not his own body as sexually dead because he was almost 100 years old 99 to be exact neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb this means Abraham didn't look at himself and say well I can't have sex anymore I'm 99 and neither did he look at his wife and say well she can't have she can't procreate anymore because she's 90 so he did not look at this as a hopeless situation why because God can uh, because God can do it he can cause procreation and then impute life at birth God does it all and this is another way for us to look at it is that God does it all the whole thing so what happens in 420 Romans 420 he Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong by means of faith giving glory to God he believed it he knew it was going to happen now he did fail sometimes we know from the fact that he had sex with Hagar that he really didn't believe it or if he did believe it he was uh, uh, l he was lusting after Hagar he may have believed it and just l lusted after Hagar either way it was wrong so Romans 4.20 he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong by means of faith giving glory to God and now as part of the background we must look at Romans 9.6 Romans 9 6 is part of the background of this allegory you'll see why we're going through all of this in a moment you'll see why we're coming to this because it's the only way you're going to understand Galatians as part of this allegory the lawyer the Apostle Paul is setting out not really a lawyer but he is a good one if he wanted to be that's Romans 9 6 Romans 9 6 it is not as though the word of God had failed and that's true although there are those who distort the word of God there are those who reject the word of God there are those who are ignorant of the word of God it does not fail it is not as though the word of God had failed for not all those who are descended from Israel are true Israel so the true concept of Israel is the remnant it is not physical birth the true concept of Israel actually started out as faith alone in Christ alone Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness Abraham had Isaac and he believed Isaac had Jacob and he believed Esau did not Ishmael did not so why do we hear God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob because those three believed the Jewish race started out as coming from faith alone in Christ alone Abraham faith alone in Christ alone Abraham Isaac faith alone in Christ alone Jacob faith alone in Christ alone now Esau was in the same bloodline but guess what unbeliever so God is not the father of Abraham Isaac and Esau and and uh, it, and neither is he the father of Abraham Ishmael and Esau as the Arabs say today the Arabs you see the reason why we have so much conflict in the world today it has already been prophesied it would occur Ishmael would always be attacking the foot as it were and so would Esau so it's not Abraham Ishmael it's Abraham Isaac and Jacob so it is not as though the word of God had failed for not all those who were descended from Israel are true Israel so Ishmael is not true Israel 
And they don't belong near Israel. And they don't even need to. Well, anyway, that's politics. I won't get into it. But the true concept of Israel is the remnant. It's not physical birth. It's spiritual birth. And the Jewish race starts with Abraham. It did not go through Ishmael. It went through Isaac. And the reason why it it went through Isaac is because Isaac had faith alone in Christ alone. So the secret to the Jewish race is faith alone in Christ alone, not the genetic birth, as the Judaizers always claim. And the reason Abraham became a Jew is because he was born again. The reason Isaac became a Jew is because he was born again. And the reason Jacob became a Jew, he was born again. So now that's the background. Now let's get back to Galatians 4.22. Galatians 4.22. And this is where we will put the allegory together. And this is where you will get a tremendous understanding of what Galatians is talking about. And it should give you an understanding of how you should act today. Galatians 4.22 For it stands written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman. Who was that? Hagar. One by the slave woman, Hagar. And the other by the free woman, Sarah. And this is where we begin the allegory. For it stands written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman, Hagar, who had Ishmael, and the other by the free woman, Sarah, who had Yitzhak, Isaac, laughter. And these are two historical sons. Now in Galatians 4.23, But Ishmael, the son by the slave woman, was born to the standard of the flesh. This means that Ishmael was born according to the standard of the flesh because Ishmael was never born again. Ishmael was born according to the standard of the flesh because he was never born again. Ishmael never believed in Christ. And this is the analogy being built here which shows what a good lawyer the Apostle Paul is. But Ishmael, the son of the slave woman, was born by the standard of the flesh, never believed in Christ. But in contrast, Isaac, Yitzhak, but in contrast, Isaac, the son by the free woman, was born by instrumentality of the promise. That's the corrected translation. So corrected translation of Galatians 4.23 But the son by the slave woman was born by the standard of the flesh. But in contrast, the son by the free woman was born by instrumentality of the promise. Now the birth of Isaac depended upon what? A promise. God promised Abraham he would receive a son. So the birth of Isaac depended upon a promise rather than on man's work. Now when Abraham decided that he was going to work for it and go have sex with uh, Hagar, what happened? A thorn in the flesh for all of history happened. Arabs. So the birth of Isaac depended upon what, who and what God was. God had promised Abraham he would have a child, yet his wife did not believe it and and he followed his wife and whenever you follow an unbelieving wife in terms of not use, she's not using the faith rest drill whenever you follow a woman not using the faith rest drill you'll end up like Abraham in a big mess you got to stand as your own man no matter what your family's doing the same goes for the woman you got to stand on faith no matter what your husband's doing so the birth of Isaac depended on the promise of God rather than on man's work so the birth of Isaac depended upon on who and what God was. The birth of Ishmael, by analogy, depended upon who and what Abraham was and Hagar. So we, he, we see here that it is the promise in which Isaac was born. Isaac was born under the promise. And in the allegory, Ishmael represents human viewpoint. And this is where the allegory starts gaining some steam. Ishmael is the human viewpoint. 
We're not going to have a child, Abram, unless you go out and have sex with Hagar. That's human viewpoint. And so Ishmael is representative of human viewpoint. And what does that mean? In the allegory, Ishmael refers to human viewpoint and it means that following the Mosaic law to be saved and therefore to be under the law is to be under slavery. Therefore, that is human viewpoint. So secondly, because of the supernatural birth of Isaac and the, the birth of Isaac was supernatural. There's no way a 99-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman is, are going to conceive unless it's supernatural because both parents were past childbearing age. Now, a man may never be past childbearing age, but it just so happens Abram himself became uh, sexually dead. So both parents were past childbearing age. And only the grace of God would be able to give Abraham Isaac. Only the grace of God. So Isaac represents what? Salvation by grace. This is where we begin the allegory. Isaac is salvation by grace. Ishmael, salvation by works or spirituality by works. Isaac, salvation by faith alone, in Christ alone, the promise. And this will expound as he continues to hammer the Galatians. Galatians 4.24 And this is the corrected translation. These things may be allegorized. That's what Paul is saying. These things may be allegorized on the basis of history. You see, sometimes allegories deal with fictitious events, but this is not. This is dealing with historical events. So in Galatians 4.24, Paul says, These things may be allegorized on the basis of history, for these represent two covenants. These are two covenants by analogy. The one from Mount Sinai keeps on giving birth to slavery. This is Hagar. So let's get Galatians 4.24 again and then we'll have an explanation of it. These things may be allegorized on the basis of history for these represent two covenants by analogy. The one from Mount Sinai keeps on giving birth to slavery. This is Hagar. So point number one from Galatians 4.24. Point number one. The Mosaic law was given to Moses outside the promised land. The Mosaic law was given to Moses outside of the promised land. Where was the law given to Moses? What land? In the land of cursing. And what is the land of cursing? The land of Ishmael at Mount Sinai. Now you should start seeing the allegory. These things may be allegorized, for these represent two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai that keeps on giving birth to slavery, this is Hagar. So again, point one, the Mosaic law was given to Moses outside the promised land, in the land of cursing, the land of cursing, the land of Ishmael at Mount Sinai. Point number two, Zion is inside of Jerusalem. Zion is inside of Jerusalem. They haven't gone there yet, and that's the place of blessing. They're not at Zion when they receive the law. Where are they? They are in the land of Ishmael. They're in the land of cursing. They're at Mount Sinai when they receive the law. When they receive the law, they're actually receiving it at a place of cursing. Not only does the law pronounce a curse upon them, but they're actually standing at a place of cursing, Ishmael, the land of Ishmael, not the land of promise. The Apostle Paul's a genius. If you can just break through and see what this is saying, you will recognize immediately. Apostle Paul's a genius. He's taking an allegory right here and saying, look, you received the law in a place of cursing. And the law itself is a curse. So Zion is inside Jerusalem, and that is a place of blessing. So we immediately have a contrast set up by this allegory between law and grace. And again, the law can only curse you. Grace can only bless you. 
So what Paul is telling the Galatians is decide right now, Galatians. You have one foot on Mount Sinai and you have another foot in grace, Zion. You have one foot on Mount Sinai. You're going for the law. You're going for the curse that was given all the way down from Ishmael. And you've got another foot inside of grace. Now you can't keep on living that way or you'll do a big split and go nowhere. And we will get some application out of this in a moment because it's very important. You can't be hobbling around with one foot in a legalistic church and another foot in a grace church and think you're going to make it. That's the analogy. You're not. So Zion is inside of Jerusalem, the place of dress, uh, blessing, and we immediately have the contrast. Now, what this also means is, is this. If there is one bit of legalism in your life, you better get off Mount Sinai. If there's one bit of legalism in your life, you better get off Mount Sinai because God cannot use anyone who has one bit of legalism in their soul. He cannot use you if you have one bit of legalism in your soul. And we studied the principle in Matthew where a little yeast leavens the whole loaf. And all it takes is a little bit. All it takes is a drop. You put a drop of yeast in a loaf and it'll blow up. I mean, it'll get bigger. I don't know much about cooking, but I know if you put yeast in bread, it expands. And even just a little bit makes it expand. So you put a little bit of legalism into your life and you're going, it's going to expand. And so you cannot live with even one bit of legalism in your life. So grace means never in one moment in phase one, which is when you believe in Christ, or phase two, the spiritual life, or phase three, will you be able to boast about anything you've done? What I'm saying is, when you believe in Christ and you're saved, you can't really boast about being saved. You can't give up, get up and give a testimony about how great you are and how you've changed, although they do it all around the country. How great you are and how you've changed because you've been saved. You're giving the credit to yourself and you don't deserve credit. And I guess the best way to do it you see, oftentimes uh, religion today says, well, in phase one, that is faith alone and Christ alone, they say, well, we can take credit for being saved. And then they say, well, we can take credit for being spiritual too because we've stopped all the bad habits we used to do. But have you ever heard them take credit for phase three? What's phase three? A resurrection body. And do you know why they, do ne they never take credit for phase three? It's quite simple. Can you create a resurrection body for yourself? No. And that's why they can never go to phase three, which is eternal life, and act as if they've done something about that. Because they can't create a resurrection body for themselves. And just as you cannot create a resurrection body for yourself in phase three, eternity, you cannot uh, do anything in phase two in terms of living the spiritual life except from the power of the Spirit and you can do nothing in phase one for salvation. And this is what Paul is getting at. Now in Galatians 4.25 Galatians 4.25 For Sinai is a mountain in Arabia. What we need to note from this is point one. For Sinai is a mountain in Arabia. Point one. Arabia is a long way from the promised land. You know what that means? It's a long way from grace. For Sinai is a mountain in Arabia, a long way from grace, a long way from the promised land, and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. Now the physical city of Jerusalem now, what do we mean by present Jerusalem? When Paul wrote this, presently Jerusalem was under the bondage of sin. It was under the bondage of the Mosaic Law. It was under the bondage of religious leaders. It was under the bondage of the Roman Empire. Again, at this point, Jerusalem was under bondage in four categories. They were under the bondage of sin, under the bondage of the Mosaic Law, under the bondage of all the religious re leaders, and under the bondage of the Roman Empire. So Sinai 
corresponds to the present Jerusalem. What he's saying is uh, Jerusalem is now a curse just like Sinai was under Ishmael. For she is in slavery accompanied with her minor children. What's that mean? For she is in slavery accompanied with her minor children. This is in pre uh, this is present indicative action which means to be in slavery in accompaniment, in accompaniment with her children. Do you remember Technon? That's what it's referring to. You're in slavery, Technon. Some of you might not remember it. You might have been out of town. You'll have to hear the tape, but I'll give you a little bit of it just for your benefit. Feel special. Technon. I'll even give you Greek for fun. Then we had this. Technon. Technon is the unbeliever. You'll, you'll just have to go back and get the tape. That would take a whole hour for me to go over. But Technon is referring to children of Abraham. Yes, they're children of Abraham. They're descended from Abraham just as Ishmael descended from Abraham. Ishmael, Technon. Esau descended from Abraham, Technon. But guess what? Isaac, Huios. Why was Isaac Huios? He became an adult son by faith alone in Christ alone. So what we have in this verse when it talks about sons, for Sinai is a mountain in Arabia and it corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery accompanied with her minor children. Minor children, technon. Accompanied with unbelievers. All of Jerusalem was filled with unbelievers. And they thought that they had some special ability because to be saved because they were descended from Abraham. We're sure they were descended from Abraham, but they never believed. So this is technon, minor, minor children. Then we have weos for those who believe. And we are weos, which makes us what? Abraham's children. Everyone who believes in Christ becomes Abraham's children. We are all weos. And Jews who never believe in Christ, they're technon. Even today, they're technon. But if they don't believe in Christ, they'll never become weos. Now, an unbeliever who is a Gentile and remains an unbeliever his whole life is neither. But there's no value in being technon unless you believe in Christ. So what? You're descended from Abraham. So what? So that's what technon means. So now, in uh, Galatians 4.26, Galatians 4.26, we have but, and but here is a conjunction of contrast. But in contrast, And what this is referring to is the Jerusalem that has been taken over by legalism. You see, we have one Jerusalem now that Paul is talking about that is taken over by Jerusalem, by legalists. Jerusalem has become a legalistic church. But in contrast to the Jerusalem taken over by legalism, the Jerusalem above. What's the Jerusalem of ab above? It's the church. It's those who've had faith alone in Christ alone. And we look forward to living in that Jerusalem above. So, but in contrast, the Jerusalem above, that's the church. Now, you might have is free in your Bible, but there's no verb. This is elliptical, and it's elliptical for emphasis. And it's saying, the Jerusalem above, free! The Jerusalem above, Free! Freedom! The church is free from the law is what Paul is saying. The Jerusalem above free, which continues to be our mother. And that means our mother city. It's the mother city where we have our heavenly citizenship. When we believe in Christ, we're guaranteed this heavenly citizenship. But it is freedom. Faith alone in Christ alone gives us freedom. We're not under the law.
Now in Galatians 4.27. Galatians 4.27. For it stands written, Receive inner happiness, barren woman. Who's the barren woman? Well, in, in this verse, what the Apostle Paul is bringing out, he's still talking about Sarah. And Sarah is the barren woman and she's in a hopeless situation. And every time you are in a hopeless situation, what must you rely on? Grace, grace, grace. The only thing that's going to get you out of it. So again, God does not help those who help themselves. God helps the helpless. And God helped the helpless who was Sarah. There was no way a 90-year-old woman could give birth to a son without the help from God. So God helps the helpless. And He helped Sarah. So how could Sarah keep on having happiness when she is in a helpless situation, as it says? For it stands written, this is corrected translation, Receive in her happiness, barren woman. How come she was happy? Because... By this point, by the time of the age of 90, Sarah had become a mature believer. And she believed the Word, and she knew that the Word spelled out grace, and she knew that the same thing would happen to her that would happen to you and me, and that is the promise would be fulfilled. And for her, she would have a child. And it's faith alone in Christ alone, and she was totally helpless in this case as well. So really what the verse is saying is the more helpless we are, the better, we, the better off we are because then we can finally rely on grace and we don't have to think we're doing anything from the energy of the flesh. The more helpless we are, the better in that we can rely on God and God's grace. For it stands written, Receive inner happiness, barren woman, who does not bear Break forth and shout, you who have no birth pains. So she's not uh, bearing. She's not having any birth pains. And, uh, but then it goes on to say this, because the desolate woman, because the desolate woman has many more children than the woman who has a husband. Who's the desolate woman here? Sarah. Because the desolate woman has many more children than the one who has a husband. So grace produces what legalism cannot, is what this verse is saying by way of allegory. Sarah at age 90 could not humanly deliver. But through grace, she has had more children than there are legalistic people. That is, more people believe in Christ. Many people have believed in Christ. So that's what it's referring to. Even though Sarah had Isaac, well, uh, more of her offspring has to do with there's been a lot of people who believed in Christ. So now in Galatians 4.28. Galatians 4.28. But we and only we, royal family, are children of the promise according to the standard of Isaac. And this means salvation without works and spirituality without works. But we and only we, royal family, are children of the promise according to the standard of Isaac. The promise means salvation without works and spirituality without works. I'll be finished in just a second because I want to make this point coming up. Galatians 4.29 but just as at that time the one born by natural descent kept persecuting the one according to the Spirit, so as it is now. Now this is the, the Apostle Paul. I'm going to finish this allegory tonight for a reason. The Apostle Paul is bringing, is he's cinching it up now. He's bringing it down to the solution, to the, uh, the solution of the fact that if you're under grace, you're going to be attacked. But just as at the, at the time the one born by natural descent, who was that? Ishmael. Kept persecuting the one born according to the Spirit or the promise. Who was that? Isaac. So it is now. Ishmael constantly attacked Isaac. Yitzhak. Constantly was at his heel, nagging at his heels. What is the spiritual allegory or the spiritual analogy? If you are under grace, you will be under attack. 
The one under the law will attack the one under grace. Just like Ishmael today attacks, the Arabs attack the Jew. Just as the Arabs attack the Jew, and you see their hatred, they strap on bombs to their body, and they run into uh, peaceful places and blow themselves up and blow up Jews. Well, believe me, people who are under legalism wish to do the same to you. They're under restraint, but they wish to do it. So again, but just as at the same time the one born by natural descent kept persecuting the one born according to the Spirit, meaning if you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to come under attack by legalism and they will attack you and attack you and attack you and attack you. What should you do about it? He gives us an answer and that's what I like. You see, oftentimes when you're attacked, you might want to swat back. Well, if we didn't get what the Bible has to say about it, well, we would swap back. Hell, I'd swap back. Well, I'd be like a maniac. I'd be, if, if God did not give me any restraint on what to do about legalism, I'd be running down every, through every legalistic church just going mad. I would be in jail. But God gives us restraint, and he tells us how to do it. So just as Ishmael per persecuted and tormented Isaac, the legalists still persecute grace believers. Now on to Galatians 4.30. Nevertheless, what does Scripture say? Not what do I say. Now, I have said it before, but I said it on the basis of what I knew Scripture said. I didn't say it just out of arrogance. I know what Scripture says. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture, the Bible say? Separate yourself from the slave woman and her son. By analogy, separate yourself from what? Legalism. Separate yourself from the slave woman and her son. Separate yourself from Hagar. For the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the son of the free woman. What Paul is telling the Galatians is you separate yourself right now from those legalists coming down from Jerusalem. You cease and desist. And he gave it to them by allegory. And they understood it. And it might be hard for us, we had to dig through all of this to get a basis for it, but he's making a very important point, and he's saying, look, the legalists are Ishmael, you're Isaac, you Galatians, you were born of a promise, you've never even heard of the law. When I came to you Galatians, I said faith alone in Christ alone, and you believed it, and you were born of a promise. Now you're going in for legalism. Now you're acting like Ishmael. But I'll tell you something, you born by faith alone in Christ alone. Those who are of Ishmael, those in legalism will attack those in grace. So you separate from them. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Separate yourself from the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the son of the free woman. What this means is that legalism cannot coexist with grace. You should separate yourself, therefore, from any legalistic church. Sure, it's hard sometimes, but you must according to Scripture. You must separate yourself from a legalistic church. You're now a grace believer. And I don't care if the only way you can get it is through tapes. you still got to separate. Because, again, there's no command that you stay under face to face and there's no command for that simply because sometimes in, in times of apostasy there's no way you can find a church like that and the fact you have one is the grace of God so legalism and grace cannot coexist and you can't have one foot in legalism and one foot in grace it doesn't work you've got to separate yourself and that's what the Bible says. Now, Galatians 4.31. Now, in conclusion, royal family, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free. And that's how he ends the allegory. We're not children of the slave woman. We're not children of the law. We're not children of having to follow the Sabbath. We're not children of having to do all these crazy weird things that people come up with and all these weird taboos. You're not children of legalism. You're children of grace. So what you should do, Galatians, separate yourself from the Judaizers. 
And he's saying, I can't come see you right now, but what I'm going to tell you to do is separate from the Judaizers or your spiritual life is over. And unless you separate from legalism, your spiritual life will be over. They will suck you away. They'll suck you away in the blink of an eye. And I'll tell you that because they sucked away Paul. Now Paul has just written Galatians. And he'll write many, many more epistles before he gets sucked away into legalism. But Paul, after writing this, after knowing this allegory, is going to go in for legalism. Why? He went against his own word and said, I'm not separating from the legalist anymore. And he started compromising with the legalist. You can't have one foot in legalism and another in grace. If you want to sprint forward to the high ground, you better have both, foot pl- both feet planted in grace and you better run to the high ground through perception of the Word. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the stark difference between grace and legalism so that we might know how to conduct our own spiritual lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.